Welcome to this edition of Cyber Focus, your source for international business news. My name is Taylor, and with me today is David Apintete, one of the leading jewelry companies in Ghana. David is on campus to talk about his economic background and his experience doing business in the operating environment in Ghana and the west coast of Africa. David, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Well, I just had a few general questions before, right as we start. You have started your business 21 years ago. Yeah. What led you to decide to start your own business, and what's your background? Yeah, my background, I'm, I'm a designer and artist. My undergrad, I trained as an artist and industrial designer. And uh, from there, I listen, I, before that high school, I, I did a, a technical education. So, and my best subject and hobby is art. So, I always love designing, creating. So I design in future, I'll do something in that field. So after, after I did my uh, postgraduate diploma as in industrial management, I decided to work for a jewelry company. Luckily, I got a Ghana government jewelry company to work in. And I went there as a jeweler and came head in that place. But what I observe about myself is I'm not a, f a formal guy. I don't like office work. <laughs> and I think it's the art in me. And I always like to feel free and control whatever I do. I don't like saying yes, sir, yes, boss. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, let me start little and do what I really love doing. Jury. Why do I like jury? Ghana is a good producing country. And we have a very rich culture. And jury plays a very important role in our culture setting. I mean, from birth to puberty to death to marriage, there are also juries we give out. So based on this concept, I realized that the jury business is where if I go, I will not lose. The raw material is there, and I think I have the talent. So I headed straight there, and since then, I never looked back. Well, it sounds like you have a very entrepreneurial mind, being that you want to be your own boss and have your own role yeah. be in control. What type of jewelry do you uh, work with? I mean, there's a vast different kind of jewelry. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I started, I started a little earlier. In my first two years, I was still working with a government company. So I realized by then our political system became stable and the tourists started coming in. So I started producing our own designs. African designs and brass that I go played, fancy jewelry. That was a big hit. But because it was fancy jewelry, I have to mechanize. And so when I decided I'm coming on my own and I changed my line, I, I needed something small. I don't want to be so stressed up. So my target was a higher end, and I do gold, silver, diamonds. I mean, higher end jewelry for the middle and upper income. So although my company is small, our target market is to do custom jewelry, not mechanized jewelry, for people who really want it. So that's our target market, and that's what I've been doing up to now. Oh, that's very interesting. I'm sure they love to share in your passion, too, of jewelry yeah. being at that higher end. Well, that's very interesting. Um, what is the kind of operating environment of Ghana like for a small business owner like yourself? It's tough. It's very tough. I'll, I'll like to. It's very tough. Minds can be very exciting too. One of the things is one of my biggest problems was when I started. I do a lot of adverts, heavy adverts. I sponsor most beauty pageants and what have you. I would like you to be one of my models. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to our, <laughs> on our I've page. I've never done that. <laughs> if you've been on our page, you see a lot of nice African or Ghanaian women modeling our jewelry. I would like to have you. No. I hope your paycheck will be small enough for me to pay. Well, I would be delighted, but... <laughs> okay. Well, so what I can say is when I started going on air, you know, we are in a country where we, we, we don't have enough information, data about everybody. So mm -hmm. small companies that come out, well registered and exposed, you get a tax man on you. So the tax men were coming heavily. Those are some of the things... The second thing is interest rates are so high. It's between 25-30%. Wow. You get what I'm trying to say. And then you don't get government, real government policies that help small businesses to grow in Africa. But the good side of it is 
uh, he, uh, the environment is not as strict as it is here. So if you are smart, you can be able to dodge enough taxes. Mm -hmm. And you don't have uh, rules and regulations that are so stiff. And, and I mean, I mean it's, it's a very good environment to operate in. And when you are able to understand the system, you can survive. So few people come and when they look at our taxes and our interest rates and how we go, they ask, how do you survive? But it's our country. And we really know how to go about it. I mean, uh, you read all the economic books and things, but you come down there, you realize that, look, before you apply them, you first have to look at the setting and know how you go by it. But it's still a beautiful country, a very nice country that you can do a lot of business in. So then, like you said, you, to overcome these challenges, you kind of really learned the local environment and really understood the government and the, and the different types of yeah. areas of business. I mean, furthermore, how do you, do you do any collaborations with other, other types of businesses or is there any overlap between your jewelry business and any other businesses in Ghana or do you kind yeah, of band I'm, together? I'm linked up with uh, most of the uh, fashion and garment industries we design together. And I uh, help most of these small scale mining firms I add value to their material. And then one of my things I do is to train a lot of youth in designing, it's not only in designing, but in other metal works. You know, when you come to Africa, it's an untapped continent. And we have a lot of unique things that have not really come out. You know, and uh, we do a lot of uh, f uh, supporting to of uh, kids that have not been deprived kids. Most of my staff are kids that I pick from the villages, and you will be amazed at level of talent if you really give them the correct training. And what's good is you train somebody, and over a period of three, four years, it's an advantage to you when they are that smart. And the labor force there is not so complicated like it is here, where people demand all sorts of things. You see people who are really anxious to learn. The only, we have a, an attitude problem, but when you, are, you know how to go about it, at least you can have things very easy. So uh, let's, and we interlink. Uh, what happens is I also, I'm also part of uh, the Federation of Craft Men, uh, craft, I mean, the craft industry too. So I do metal works, interior design, like wrought iron metal works and what have you. And it's because of my design department. My design department out, outgrows the jewelry sector. We, some of the jewelry we design can even go into real estate designs. And we even use them for monuments and what have you. Okay. So is that industrial? the designing of the industrial type of things. Yeah. Is that with your jewelry business or is it separate? Um, I, I haven't formally separated it. I have a very good design department. What I do is as much as the company is going, where you always see me is in the design room. And, and I like really changing the environment. Not only changing the ladies by looking real, but also changing the environment. So I'm a very big designer department that I get of people come in for concepts, you know. We do medallions, we do crowns for most of these beauty pageants, and we do a lot of trophies before we do samples and metal sculpture pieces. But I'm now thinking of formally separating that and making it mm -hmm. a big business. Well, I mean, the jewelry business is obviously always changing. Every season there's something new. What type of uh, ways do you gather your inspirations internationally? I mean, the jewelry business, like we were talking about earlier, is so different all over the world. Um, how do you kind of tie in that Ghana culture? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. In Ghana, um, what happens is we have a style, and we, our color schemes are very bold and bright. We go with primary colors. I don't know if you've watched this uh, the Ghana supporters on the World Cup. I mean, if you see our colors, even our national flags, we like loud colors. And where I get most of my inspiration, it's I get it from the youth. I go to the beaches, I go to the nightclubs, and mm -hmm. look, uh, the way they dress. Out of out of it, I'm able to pick things that I'm able to create very interesting things. And one of my biggest lessons is the tourist market. Uh, most of the time, I like 
going through magazines and what have you, but mo we have a, a big Tory citizen in Ghana that's growing every year. When they come, I really look, if you come, the way you dress, I just go ahead and pick a lot of things from it. And I'm able to create very unique African style. My, my uh, effort is always to bring out the African image. I know if I go, I like Italian jewelry a lot. It's one of the best. But I can't go there. No, that's, that's them. That's their culture. That's their style. I think Africa, we should also bring our own concept and then show our own image. And we can be on the world stage. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. I mean, having that specific niche and really kind of taking inspiration from everywhere, yeah. but then making it back, bringing it back to the culture and through the youth is a very interesting and exciting oh, feat. Um, we talked about the challenges, but if you could ch change maybe one thing about the environment in which your business operates, what would it be? What kind of recommendations would you wish to see doing business? Oh, yeah. Um, what I, uh, what's, when you're talking about the environment, what I would think is uh, we mine gold, uh, methods of mining really affect the environment. I mean, I'm a small company. I don't know how I can change it. But I, as much as possible, I try to use a lot of organic stuff and mix it with a precious jewelry. And I use a lot of silver too. And I want people to be conscious about what they wear and make sure that at least uh, the designs that we come out of late does not offend the environment. And you know, uh, it's very difficult to say you are going green in jewelry. Right. Very, very difficult. But all the same, I, I wish and uh, through uh, any programs that come out that support the environment that has a fashion link, I really go there. I really go there. And what I'm also thinking of, and it's a future thing, I'm thinking how best I can get out of scraps and what have you, recycle stuff for jewelry. I don't know how that will feel in the future, but it's something I'm, ex I'm highly excited about. Oh, that's very exciting. And I mean, you have all the youth behind you to help you yeah. and train them and be able to put your minds together to create those ideas. Yeah. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Um, I guess kind of along the lines of uh, advice, we have students and professionals that are watching our video right now. What kind of advice would you have for them? Yeah, what I can tell them is, um, it's like uh, my little, my being here and what I've seen. You get, uh, Kelly Business School is doing a great job because the guys who are working on my group are so good. But what I, re I want to tell them is, it's not about the big corporate organizations. They should target greener fields. I'm inviting them to Africa, to Ghana. There are opportunities. They are so talented. When they come there, they can really make billions because they are far ahead of us in everything. So when they come there and they put their eyes on, they can really make it. And by the time, yeah, I have the feeling that in future, Africa will be that continent that everybody is rushing to because everywhere is choked. So their focus, is, their focus should be there and they should come home. We are there and we show them how to really make it big. Oh, that's good to know. I mean, collaboration and being able to share yeah. with everyone different insights and then coming together and really come trying to just be in the same project and do the same thing is really inspiring. And yeah. to find a way to do that, breaking all the cultural barriers is definitely uh, an exciting new challenge. Yeah. So thank you for that advice. Um, is there anything that I haven't talked to you about today that you would like to discuss? Or is there anything more on your background? Or what's new on the horizon? What are you looking forward to this upcoming year in the jewelry business? Well, I'm trying to do a lot of few shows, and uh, my target is to hit uh, South Africa. They have a huge international jewelry fair and fashion show. I want to be there and come up with something unique. Um, so most of my designs are still on the drawing board. But I hope I can create an impact today. You know, that's that's why I think uh, well, that's where my focus is. What's happening now, it's... Uh, one of the disadvantages is gold prices you can never predict. So I hope it still goes down. Mm -hmm. and business goes good, you know. And our staff too depends on how good the economy is. You know, jewelry is a luxury product. So when the economy is good and 
people have excess money. They really want to look good, although it's an investment product. So we, in Africa, everything, we, we add God. We all pray to God that it's a good year, good prices are good, everything goes well, and I can achieve my dreams of being this shoes I'm talking of. Okay, and with the volatility of gold, uh, how do you kind of uh, account for that? But account for that um, when when you said like the prices of gold are high. Um, are there things in your business that you do that are in complementary to the gold production jewelries? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, one thing about jewelry is those who buy jewelry always knows much about gold. I'm talking of those who buy gold jewelry. You know, you get few people who come to buy gold jewelry, and so when the prices are high, they know. They really don't understand. But to get in more people to come and buy, and one of the problems in Ghana is they like during 18 karat. You know, so it's about letting them accept that we can do it in 14 and 9. I mean, it's a, it's a strong marketing game. And sometimes we try to do the 14, but to bring them, because that's when it can be more affordable. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, 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 you can never predict, that's a sad thing in the jewelry industry, you can never predict how the gold goes. It's only the gold merchants who really can say, well, but we are in the fashion world. We just add value to it. But our only luck is most of our customers really know what goes on in the gold market. So that sustains our business. If not, I don't know where we'll wrap in. Okay, well, thank you for that. And thanks for all your insight today. I know I've learned a lot, and we really appreciate you coming here, so uh, thank you. Thank you, too, for bringing me here. Well, that concludes this edition of Cyber Focus. Um, thanks for coming to speak today, and thank you to the Kelly Graduate Global Business and Social Enterprise Program for sponsoring David today. If you have any questions or suggestions for further topics, please contact CIBER at indiana.edu. Thanks.